Full HD. Which means that we are now live. And that people can see us, can join us on Facebook, on YouTube. On Hello, party people. Channels. Good afternoon. Happy International Dog Biscuit Appreciation Day, everyone. It's a good one. <laughs> that How is a brilliant day. <laughs> dog business. Dog Biscuit <laughs> Appreciation Day. Yep. So, D-Bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> Well, that right, and more so... coming up on today's webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so more importantly, if you're joining us today, please let us know in the comments um, where you're from because we'd like to know who is joining us today in this webinar. In Well, actually, nice weather in the Netherlands now. It's uh, about 30 degrees warmer than it was last week. <laughs> yeah, it is. it's so... great weather. I love it. Yeah. yeah, do let us know if you're from a place where the weather is even better than it is here. Chester in the UK, that is good. And hi, Michael from New York. It's good to see those come in always. It's also, it's always very fun to, to hear from all of y'all. <laughs> yeah, I see France. I see, well, the Netherlands joining us. Hey, Wiegen. That's exciting. Yes. Someone Very from Wiegen nice. who isn't actually working for us. So that's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah. Is I'm this the right Beacon time? A... To... Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering is this the right time to mention uh, yoast.com slash jobs? Uh, yeah. Yoast.com slash jobs is always a good thing to mention. So did I mention yoast.com slash jobs? <laughs> I think you did now. <laughs> Oh, somebody in the chat claims that it's sunny in the UK, which is a blatant lie. I can Calispera, Georgios. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you join us from Greece. I wish, wish, wish I could be in Greece right now. I'm seeing quite a bit of South Africa as well. And they probably beat us in weather today. And Spanish. Hablo poco pito español. Yeah, that's just him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm I'm linguistically handicapped i only speak two languages that's one more than a lot of americans um <laughs> <laughs> yeah joburg all right Shall we get the show on the road? Yeah, that sounds like a plan. I um, have a lot of stuff to talk about, so... Yeah, it, this is I, uh, very unusual. Yeah, it, well, it's, it, it, it always takes us a while to get through the list, and the list is longer than it is normally, so... It's <laughs> going right. to take us a while, yeah. Yes. Um, so, while we, I get the screen share in, uh, let me also introduce the two of you so for everyone joining us today welcome at this february's webinar today with you is joost de valik um, he is the founder of joost and he is the man to talk to when it comes to seo <coughs> and he is joined today by jono elderson the guy who is joining us from the uk and knows everything um, everything about SEO and cats. So your questions today, please focus them on SEO. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> Are we not going to talk about cats? That is sad. Okay, so we've got a lot of news to cover and we're going to go through that. Thank you, Chaco, for those introductions. They always make me go um but that's probably good um we're gonna start with uh good news from google then we've got some wordpress news we've got some facebook stuff we've got some other stuff we have a lot to talk about so let's dive right in um first of all all core web vitals need to be met for a ranking boost Jono, does that mean that we have to get them all in the green and I can't hear you. 
I've got to unmute my mic. That's the secret. <laughs> um, step one for how do you rank your website? Unmute your mic. Um, yes, is the short answer. So Google has announced that come May, these core web vitals metrics will be a ranking factor. We've discussed this. Um, it's very, there's a lot of noise in the SEO um, space. However, core web vitals isn't one thing. It's four metrics, um, which you can see in the picture. Um, you can use um, various tools, including Google's Lighthouse and page speed insight tools to check these and yes if you want to get the ranking boost that comes with scoring well you have to score well on all of them you can't have a really really fast um first input delay and a really really slow largest contentful paint for example all of these need to be fast where that gets tricky is um these metrics look at real users um using your website across the web using chrome on different devices from different countries. So you can't just make things fast for people on desktops in the next city to you. You really have to think globally and universally, omni-device, omni-channel, all of those words, your, your website really has to be fast. Otherwise you will um, miss out on that. Also, I know we've got a lot to get through, but this is really interesting. Um, this is also measured on pages which you know index from search engines and Google, on pages behind logins, on pages that um, Google will never see because they're sampling data from users um, in the real world. That's a slightly different thing to how Google crawls and analyzes your website. So it's not enough just to make the Google friendly bits of your site fast. You need a fast experience overall, which is quite a big challenge. Is it uh, tied to where you have analytics stuff or is it on, it's all Chrome based? It's all Chrome based. This is real user data being reported back via Chrome. So it's um, yeah, very so so we should block all our editors from actually sending data to Google. Uh, quite possibly. That's definitely one way of doing it. And you can you can you can prevent Lighthouse, etc. from calling this, but then you're definitely not going to get the benefits of um, the pay, the ranking boosts from kicking the scores. Hmm. Okay, there's going to be interesting bits about this. Okay, um, yes. let's move on because there's a lot. Um, this is always fun. Every two weeks in my mind, I have to explain to people that there's a difference between stuff that helps you not rank as much as, as well as you can and stuff that is a penalty. And these are two different boxes. If you have get a penalty for something from Google, then you have done something bad in their eyes and they are punishing you for it. If and that's incredibly you, rare to be like, yeah, that that that, that really rarely happens. It, it if it happens to you a lot, you're doing something wrong. Um if it happens to you at all, you're you've probably done something wrong. So most of the things that we do in SEO is optimize. So duplicate content is not a penalty. There is no duplicate content penalty. But if you have four pages that all focus on the same key phrases or on very similar key phrases, and you have links pointing to all four of them, then the chances that you're not ranking as well as you could if you had only one of those and uh, and all those links pointing to one page. That is what duplicate content is. It's not any harder than that. So don't think about it as a negative ranking factor or a penalty. That is all bullshit. It is just something that prevents you from, well, ranking well. So, that. Put that off your chest. <laughs> yeah, it's... It's as much. It's more of a user experience thing than it is an SEO thing, right? Why would you have twenty very, very similar pages? Why would you have twenty very similar categories or tags that have the same posts in them? As a user, that's a really rubbish experience. It's confusing. It wastes my time. Like make less, but make it better. Yeah, agreed. And if you're talking about cross-site duplicate content, which this could also be talking about. Don't copy content from other people. It's a bad idea. Okay. If they copy it from you, get, the, get them to remove it. This is not new either. Call to action overlays can hurt your Google rankings. What a surprise. It's funny that the SEO search engine roundtable wrote about this and not the search engine journals, which <laughs> has these things all the time. Yep. And does and does them so well that my cookie my ad blocker doesn't stop them. 
Um, but yeah, th so these things can hurt you. Don't do them. It's and there's a, it's part of a bigger thing, right? That if you're if what you're doing is creating resources and writing blog posts and create crafting pages that are designed to attract people from search that answer their problems and help them out, and then you trick them by whacking a load of banners on it or filling it full of adverts or forcing them into some kind of awkward conversion funnel, you've not helped them. You've not solved their problem and it's not a good experience. And that's what Google's really trying to prevent. You can't do good SEO and then whack a big conversion banner in front of it and still be good. You've got to genuinely help the user. Yeah. So, so all of these things that we just talked about are site quality and your site quality matters. Anyway, next. There's a quick a quick way to learn more about your search results. Jono, tell me. Yeah, this was interesting. Uh, Google announced this a week or so ago. They're adding like an information link into um, mobile results in particular to say what is this search result and where did it come from. Um, if I was a cynical person, I might suspect that this is a legal consideration. They don't want to be blamed for stealing content or they don't want people to say, oh, I didn't know what I was clicking on. Um, so that it's, it's not entirely clear what this is for, who it's for. However, the SEO industry has already noticed that the descriptions you get that say, what is this site? What's the brand? What's it about? Are largely sourced from Wikipedia. So maybe if you were looking for tactics around this, I would be going and checking on your brand's Wikipedia description, its information. Um, obviously, don't go and fill it full of spam, but make sure that it's a good description, that it reflects what you're about, so on and so forth. Um, I, I don't know if this will stick around. It feels a little bit like um, Google responding to some pressure they might have had, but it's worth looking at. Uh, yeah, it, it does feel a bit like it's, uh, it adds some of the required attribution that some some law, uh, countries might be asking for, in which case it's probably not going anywhere, and it uh, yeah. and it's there to, well, basically prevent them from getting sued, yeah. um, which uh, is in their best interest. Um. This was interesting. Google adding or basically saying, oh, b wait, we forgot a bit of the data that we should have <laughs> added to the Discover report. Yes. So very briefly, then Google Discover is um, not Google search. It's the thing that turns up on your mobile device. And when you open new tabs, if you're using Android, uh, where Google kind of automatically suggests content you might be interested, like a kind of news stream, like a Facebook wall, if anyone remembers that. Um, and it's been quite hard for the SEO space to understand what is this thing, how does it work, and how do I measure it? Like, so we at Yoast quite often will find, we'll wake up and we'll look at our stats and we'll see, oh, we got a load of traffic yesterday from Google Discover, and it's not really clear what influenced that and what's going on. And now it turns out that was only some of the data. They hadn't been reporting on um, all of the clicks that came through from when you open a new tab on Android, I think. Um, it was only like homepage searches and stuff. So now we should get a much more complete view of that, which might help us understand um, what's going on. But yeah, it does feel a little bit like they just missed half the data. We shall yeah, answer that. I, it, was, it was funny. It came up last week when I recorded a podcast with Jess Schultz. I don't even know whether that's out yet. I don't think it is. But um, it'll come up in that when that comes out. Do listen to it, the OSSEO podcast. It's awesome. Go subscribe. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, next I w uh, was, oh, 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 oh. oh, this is not new either, but Google can recognize if a site has a good reputation on a specific topic area. Well, of course it can. That's what the whole EAT thing was about in the first place. Um, expertise, authority, trust. Am I saying it right? Uh, <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, so there's, these news articles are interesting, but at the same time, it, it also makes you think whether people actually read what, what Google says. <laughs> yeah, um, not a huge amount to add there, just that um, this is across your whole site and your whole brand, isn't it? So this is you, essentially you need to do more than just write articles about topics. You need to be building a brand and creating a narrative that we've started all of that, which is much harder, but they're looking to reward that kind of expertise. And in, when you go into the details, they'll say, if I'm searching for shoes, they know that Adidas is a significant and reputable enough brand that even though it's not a perfect fit, they maybe ought to show it. 
what you want to be aspiring to as a brand is to build that same kind of association. Yeah. Which is why we do all these webinars, etc. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, did we have a did we did we ditch this one? I think we've switched the order slightly, but very briefly then. So Google yeah. have formally published some of their documentation on um, things that will get you banned from Google News and Google Discover. Um, so on the topic of penalties and Google Discover, most of this is fairly straightforward and obvious. It's things like um, don't fill it full of unpleasant language and not hate content. But um, the one that stood out was um, transparency. Um, so uh, things like if your sources aren't very well cited or if your author doesn't have a byline or maybe your maybe your article was authored by site admin which i know a lot of brands do because they're not necessarily comfortable putting a person with a name and an image maybe they don't have somebody maybe they're worried they'll leave all of these things damage the transparency and therefore the authenticity and the trustworthiness of the article so if you're wanting to use content to attract engage convert you really need a name, a face, a job description, a URL, evidence of expertise. It's the same stuff we've been saying for a while, but Google are now saying you are not going to be eligible for news or discover if you are not transparent. I think that's big. It is big. And it, there's actually some things in schema for news as well, where you can be transparent about your sources, etc., which is stuff that we yep. are looking at. Uh, it's very interesting to play with. Um, OK, passage ranking. This is funny. Um, Barry asked about this. Then he didn't respond fairly quickly. But then he responds the next day and says it was live two days, uh, two hours after you asked, as though they had to remind it to be put it live almost. <laughs> um, honestly, passage ranking is a very hard topic in many ways because it's very unclear still what, how much this impacts and and and. and and well, what it does, because you can't really recognize when passage ranking is being used. Um, so, yeah, makes it hard. Yeah, I would. I think the same advice we've given before still stands, which is to make sure that your content is well structured, that you're using headings and subheadings to tell a story. You don't just have a page that's a wall of text about six different things. You clearly delimit and take the user through that. However, you do that in a way that you try and be careful that it doesn't look like SEO content, where you we've all seen those pages, where best ways to get value out of thing, best places to find it make it natural and make it good, but structure it, have different answers and different questions that flow through naturally. Yeah. Um, okay. I think this is where, oh yeah, this is interesting and related. Um, but the, the whole, if you see these, uh, sorry, I need to go back and look forward. So the whole scroll to text thing that Google has in uh, some search results, it's unrelated to passage ranking, which is good to know because it means that you, don't need to relate those things. I think that one seeing one is the proof of the other. Um, this is a new thing that Google announced yesterday, I think, or today, site association settings. Yep, this is really unexciting, but bear with me. Um, so this, if you, if you connect your Google Analytics account to your Search Console account, you can get data from both in the other one, which is quite handy. You can do the same with YouTube, Google Ads, and these systems can share data. That's not new but the interface for doing that has been really awful for years. It's been hidden away and complicated and clunky. Much nicer now, really nice. What's interesting is I went in to set it up for Yoast.com and I noticed that our search console connection was using the wrong profile. So you may remember, oh, ages ago now, um, but Google um, allows you now to register search console accounts at a domain level rather than a host name level. So we can register Yoast.com and all of its subdomains as a search console property and see it all, super handy. We hadn't connected that search console to our analytics, so we were missing a ton of data. So go in here, have a look, make sure everything's connected to the right things. You might spot an opportunity to enrich all these different systems talking to each other. And which only goes to show we make stupid mistakes in our own configuration too. Yep, lots to um, do. There's one thing that we don't have a slide for, but that I do want to mention. Um, Google Search Central Live, which is yet another very long name. Uh, it's basically <laughs> an, a, an event by Google 
online with speakers from Google um, is happening tonight slash tomorrow, I think, or is it tomorrow night? I'm not entirely sure. It says February 24th, and they said in the blog post that they're deliberately targeting the Asia Pacific time zone and regions. So when I look at the page, which I'm sure we've linked to, it says February 24th at midnight GMT because it's localizing for me. I'm not entirely sure which side that falls on, but go have a look at the page. It will tell you in your time zone. Yeah, but it's, I, okay. it's, it's tonight ish, tomorrow ish. Sure. Yeah, we've shared we've shared the link in the chat, so go click that link if you want to look at it. And there yes. will probably be recordings from this somewhere at some point. Um, then I'm gonna go through the next slide very quickly because we're just gonna ignore that because blah, not interesting. Um, and then we have WordPress news. This was well, I tweeted it myself, so it was probably big. Um, <laughs> now uh, WordPress passed forty percent market share, which is astonishing as we were only just talking about wordpress passing 33.3 percent market share less than a year and a half ago um 40 percent of all websites in the world in the top 10 million websites are now powered by wordpress which is an astonishingly large amount it really is very, very much. And what well, we've seen it ourselves, of course, Yoast has grown alongside WordPress for the last decade. Um, but it is very good to see. And it, it does beg the question of where does this stop? And I think it's something we probably don't acknowledge enough that not only is the adoption growing, but the feature set is growing and the capabilities are growing and the power is growing and WordPress as a whole is growing and improving. So I, if I were thinking, what should I bet my platform on being in the next two, five, ten years? I think st sticking with WordPress feels like a pretty sensible bet given its trajectory on all of those areas. I wasn't planning on going anywhere. <laughs> um, it, if you've not done any WordPress yet, we have a great and free WordPress for beginners training that you really should start with if you want to. Now, this is something that makes me very happy. So in WordPress mm. 5.7, we, we, as a WordPress community, will actually make it easier for people to migrate from HTTP to HTTPS. One of the most installed plugins for WordPress right now is a plugin that helps you migrate from HTTP to HTTPS. It's a great thing to build by Dutch people as well. Um, but honestly, this should not be a plugin. This should be in core. And as of 5.7, it is in core and it will um, well, basically allow you to switch to HTTPS a lot easier. And this is such now it feels like a technical and important thing, but it is so critical. I mean, the big argument is the security that it, you want to be protecting your users and your files and all those things. But also all of the modern, exciting new things that are happening on the web, whether it's AMP, whether it's next generation performance techniques, whether it's fancy image formats, all of these things require you to be on HTTPS. So if your website doesn't have that secure mode, or the padlock in the bar, however it's displayed nowadays, and it's not running on HTTPS, definitely put this up on your priority list. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, we're very happy to see that. And good work, a Google team, because this was built by mm. Felix, uh, who is an, a former colleague of ours and is now in the Google's WordPress team and uh, was one of the people working on this. So I'm very happy for them to do this. Um, Gutenberg marked its 100th release with their 10.0 release. They basically do a release, a, a dot release all the time. And then so, so you get 10 point, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, etc. And so this is their 100th release. That's a lot. And it, yeah. it also made me realize that Gutenberg has been around for quite a while now. Yes, this is not new. So if you still haven't at least tried it and recently i know there's a lot of people tried it quite early and didn't get on with it and they did have some issues but this is so fluid and so like there's a there's a step between i've written about this on our site but if you want to be competing with other sites in organic search for quality of an experience you need to be authoring and publishing content not just writing words and this makes it so easy to do this. It's a fluid, sleek experience to drop in some columns, plonk an image in, align some content, style this bit out. You need to be thinking like that about almost constructing your pages rather than just writing them. And this is the toolkit to do that with. 
Yeah, it is. It is really phenomenal. And, and the, uh, the more I look at it and then I compare it to other CMSs and other e-commerce platforms out there and I play with their editors and I'm like, oh my God, this is yeah. so stuck in the nineties. So yeah, now I'm very, very happy uh, with it. And Gutenberg right now is really, really much, much better than it was when it came, first came out. So if you're still stuck in classic, please do try Gutenberg and do play with it. And if you need a, a crash course, we have one on yoast.com that you can take for free that can help you to learn the ropes and play with it. And unlock, uh, unlock that competitive advantage for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I do truly think it is, is a, a, a really big competitive advantage to build and author content within Gutenberg. Okay, we've got Facebook news and it's the same Politics. Facebook news. It's the same Facebook news that everybody has, literally everybody, because uh, Facebook restricts the, new, the sharing of news in Australia. This is outdated as we created it this morning because it apparently has been recalled a bit after some amendments that were made to the law uh, or were proposed to the law yesterday. All of this is politics. And I try to stay away from this sort of politics because it gets messy. It became even messier today as Microsoft waded in and started pu partnering with publishers in Europe to get similar laws going in Europe. It is weird. I, it, it, I don't really know whether it's helping anyone other than those publishers. Um, and if it does that, it might even be a good thing. But um, as you were saying, Jono, this really does help us define what news sites actually are. Yeah, this was the really interesting. So the politics aside, this was the interesting bit for me is I know there were a lot of websites in Australia who found that they'd been banned by Facebook that didn't class themselves as news sites. They were community forums. They were information hubs that had been considered to be news and obviously this raises the really interesting question, which I think we've raised for the last few times we've done these sessions. What is news in Google's ecosystem, in Facebook's ecosystem? Because I, as a blogger, can write a news article, or write an article that I think is news or don't think is news, and then there is no standard. And I think the thing that we're increasingly seeing is that anything can be news. Any website, any publisher can produce news. Your B2B company blog can write news. It doesn't need to be a news site. Um, and I think if we need to be starting to think that way, that a lot of what we publish maybe should be considered to be news or we could optimize for it as if it were news. And I don't think these hard separations of this is a newspaper site and this is a blog uh, really make sense anymore, especially as we see Google extracting and sourcing bits of this content from all over the place. So it's very, very blurred now. Yeah, it is blurred. But at the same time, this Google is now paying those publishers and they're only paying the really big ones. So yep. it, it opens up a barrier to entry for the news market that I, well, if I can wade into the politics for 10 seconds, I don't think is a good idea. Um, but yeah, no, it is, um, uh, well, this stuff's happening. If you're in Australia, it actually probably affects you. If you're not, it probably doesn't. But we might see similar stuff in Europe at some point. There's other stuff as well. Um, Shopify shop pay now you have to explain this to me john just... <laughs> got the cool kids in to explain the new the new technologies i don't know anything about tiktok i'm not in the podcast. <laughs> no um okay so this this i stumbled across as a user just this week and it blew my mind a little bit so i caught this came out i think last year and it's shopify's um it was launched as an app, a, a mobile app by Shopify that meant you could browse Shopify's catalog across all of Shopify sites, which I think is quite an interesting idea. It's Amazon, like an Amazon-esque experience overlaying Shopify. Pretty cool. Um, however, what's starting to change is they've just rolled out um, more and more um, payment and transaction integrations into other places. So this news specifically is you can use, you can pay via the shop with a one-click payment in Facebook and Instagram. So what we start to see is this Shopify shop is the best of 
for example, Stripe or PayPal and does everything that they do from a transactional payment gateway perspective, but also it's an e-commerce platform and a marketplace. This is a viable competitor to Amazon, but sourcing across all the Shopify sites rather than Amazon's warehouse. I think this is huge and it's only going to get bigger. And I stumbled across it by chance. I ordered a takeaway from somewhere off the grid that um, used ShopPay. And when I authorized it and logged in, it had all of my um, pending deliveries from Amazon, all of the stuff I've bought on Shopify sites over the last few years, and all of their order status. Like, hey, this is new. This is exciting. I, yeah, I, I, I really like it. And it, it, it is also a way of actually of monetizing things like Instagram in a way that we we're all not going to get annoyed. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I I am really happy to see stuff like this. In in related news, uh, Shopify says um, that they see their revenue growth slowing, and I'm like, yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, because didn't you see it double the last webinar <laughs> we did, and didn't you see your conversion rates? Like, the numbers we shared last time were insanely high because everybody started shopping online. Yeah, it's it's not, you can't ha keep up like growth like that because if the entire population comes online, you don't have a second group of entire population <laughs> to come online the next time. So that yes. is it seemed quite logical to me, but their shares sunk a bit. So apparently, this was not logical to investors. Um, but yeah, um, but also related, Amazon acquired a, co a competitor of Shopify called Celts, which, which honestly I had never heard of before. Um, but it, it, it seemed like a smart thing to do in many ways, to buy yourself something like that as well, to play with an experiment. Yeah, I'm, I'm nervous about this. It's the same thing that Facebook are doing, which is trying to get the business owners and the retailers to go all in on their platform. And then they st like, so if you if I can run my entire business and all of it selling through Amazon, why do I need a website? Why do I need to blog? Why should I be active on social media? And the answer to all of those questions is brand and ownership, because if you're not active in those spaces, all you're competing on is price and it's a race to the bottom in these environments. So interesting, good tools, access your consumers, yay, but make sure that you're still building your own equity in a place that you control. At the same time, if this means that you can build a website on your own domain while still using Amazon's back channel and everything that nice. they have in terms of logistics, I see definite benefit in that. So there is, oh, there's a lot of sides to this. And it's going to be very interesting in the next few years to see what happens there. Um, then there's one thing we don't have a slide for because, well, we added it too late. Uh, but I did want to mention that Moz uh, overhauled their whole uh, domain authority thing. Um, I, I do think it's good if we share that link uh, in in uh, the channels. So the team will now, I know. Um, but um, they they made their whole domain authority thing that they do for link metrics smarter. Um, is that, you know, they made it smarter, right? That's the word. Yeah, is, is, is there another word for it? No, smart is good. I think that wraps it like, so this hasn't launched yet. It's launching on the 5th of March. And the link is a kind of an unofficial announcement from Rand Fishkin, who founded Moz, but no longer works there. So take all of it with some context. But yeah, the gist was um, many, many people use domain authority, the metric as a kind of indicator of website value or the value of a link. And it's quite handy as a, at a glance, is this a big website or a small one? But it's also misused and misunderstood in a lot of ways. However, this big update that they're announcing um, should make it more sophisticated, something, something machine learning, AI, and better spam detection, all of which should mean that if you wanted a metric to say, how, how good is the SEO of this website, at least when it comes to links, it's probably not the worst metric and certainly it will be much better than it is today um, other tools exist other metrics exist but domain authority has classically been one of the main ones everyone uses yeah okay now it's been the banner has been here for a while we've got some yoast news to share only a little it's like six slides it's ridiculous um <laughs> so we added a yoast breadcrumbs block um which 
is fun now and will be even more fun when we have full site editing later on so that you can define your site things and then play with that breadcrumbs block so that's why we prepared it um we also in your seo 15.9 have been working a bit on some performance improvements um because well it's what we do and we also in, in, improved some of those image fields um it's simple stuff but it does make your life a bit easier um because you can actually see what which logo you uploaded instead of having to copy paste the image url and stuff like that um our team created a new digital story on schema i think you worked a lot on this as well jono i, I uh, touched it i doubled yeah big, big uh, schema nerd um I am honestly very proud of these digital stories that we do. This is the power of Gutenberg that we talked about earlier. This is built in Gutenberg. It's it's phenomenal that you can do this in WordPress without any very expensive tooling, just being a couple of geeks and, uh, and building something nice. It does help if you have good writers and designers. Um, mm. But yeah, no, it's it's a very it's a very fun. Go see a, a digital story about what schema is, how it affects um, rich results, and how structured data in general, what it does, and why why it's a great thing. Um, I mentioned the SSE po SEO podcast before. Um, this one's out uh, with Perna, uh, a friend of mo both mine and Jono. She works for LinkedIn. It's a great. Uh, a podcast on how to build your brand on LinkedIn. I think it's very worth listening to. She's uh, a great resource on, on stuff like this. And um, upcoming is the, all, already out there. I don't know. Ninko will probably tell me in chat in, in about five seconds is uh, the podcast with uh, Jess Schultz, uh, who talks, uh, who I talk to about uh, Discover a lot, which is, uh, well, really a topic that is very interesting and she just told me it's already published so you can already go and listen to it so go subscribe nice. to the occo podcast i should be more awake of on these things but i'm i've just been on holiday for two days um and last week no a week and a half ago um no yeah, week and a half ago almost two weeks we crossed 300 million downloads with occo which just baffles me is 300 million times someone has updated or installed GSSEO somewhere. And that is just a mind blowing number. Uh, it's a lot of people doing doing a lot of stuff. Um, uh, I see in the questions and I'm going to answer that one straight away. What are digital stories? Well, digital stories are basically stories that have both video and, and um, interactive elements and uh, video uh, uh, and text and everything combined into one large thing. So um, that's what we call a digital story. Uh, and I wanted to ask you all, you, hmm. our dear, lovely, lovely listeners, fans, whatever you call yourself, if you're a fan of Yoast SEO, go vote for us in Talks Plugin Madness because there's a competition. And if we join in a competition, we want to win because we are SEOs. It's what we do. <laughs> so go do that. And with that, we probably have time for a lot of questions, don't we, Taco? Yes, Hi. we absolutely You're back. do. Yeah, I just appear out of nowhere every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me show your faces a little bigger because, you know, that's what people come for. I do um, that. Um, I, I, I hope they come for the content and not for the... <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, let me scroll up a bit because a lot happened in the chat and I like to show the people who are asking the great questions. But you can already start talking. Um, I, I, so... I, I've i actually seen one. I, I've seen the questions already, so that's good. Um, yeah. So um, the, the someone first asked... One. Yeah, the first, the first one. You're looking at the one up, right? Uh, it was yeah. funny. Because someone is asking us to define FCP, FID, LCP, and CLS. Um, we should probably do just give you a webinar, Jono, on on these things, and and or make you talk about this for an hour because this is not something that we can explain in in five or ten minutes. 
No, you're right. That's a good idea. Um, and we have we've touched on it when Google announced it. So the 10 second version, I guess, is it's first contentful paint, first input delay, largest contentful paint and cumulative layout shift. These are Google's four new speed metrics. Go play with the Lighthouse or PageSpeed Insights tool and there is documentation there. But yes, we should cover this in more detail um, for you guys at some point. Yeah, it is. Um, it is hard. I'm not going to lie. It, I uh, yep. I think it's it's rather hard to get this right. I know that we have a hard time. And certainly more than just installing a caching plugin, it requires uh, theme engineering and understanding of CSS and JavaScript and I mean, all sorts of stuff. But yeah, we can do yeah. all that. Yeah, and and especially if you need to do this worldwide, um, doing it without any a, a tool like Cloudflare or something similar is is going to prove to be harder and harder. I think. So Jonathan uh, Roberts question, what would you recommend for improving mobile page speed? Well, first of all, improving page speed. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to ignore the mobile bit because <laughs> honestly, there is the same thing. Um, your pages should be clean and lenient and very lenient and very, and you should not have as, uh, um, a lot of, well, cruft on them. Um, but it's, easier said than done because a lot of the themes out there actually add a lot of stuff and then a lot of the plugins out there add even more stuff to your pages and most of that you don't need for every page load but it's added on every page load and then fixing that is actually fairly hard um it's one of the things gutenberg is actually pretty good at and a lot of ha a lot of development is happening right now on making gutenberg only load for instance the css for the blocks that are on the page and not making it load the CSS for blocks that are not on the page. It's simple stuff like that will actually make a, a large difference. Um, can we? Are we going to give any uh, any recommendations for plugins for that, Jono? Are there any plugins? Oh, that you, Cloudflare and either WP Rocket or W3 Total Cache, but those are kind of the tip of the iceberg. I would I would do two things. One is I would go and run the Google PageSpeed Insights or Lighthouse tool and see what it says. Read the recommendations, have a look. And the other thing is I would obsess about everything that it flags as being slow. Find images that you can reduce two kilobytes off. Stop loading that font that you don't really need that you could use a system one for. Look at every small piece of every page and say, can I make this bit faster? There isn't, there aren't really many shortcuts other than uh, kind of going through it like that. Um, but yeah, we should we should cover off all this stuff on a, on another webinar. Yeah, we should. Um, uh, we're, I'm going to get uh, Ninka to plan that with you, and I'm not going to be there. <laughs> oh, sad. <laughs> all right. So meanwhile, I've got a related question that was a bit trigger happy, so maybe you saw it already. <laughs> yeah. Um, PHP version, how much does it matter for SEO? I love that he's saying that his PHP is stuck on 7.3. I I would love for the entire web to be stuck on 7.3 because so many people are stuck on 5.6. Uh, it's not 7.3. Honestly, is fine. Um, don't don't worry about that for the next three four years. Um, 7.4, of course, is faster. Uh, but and I. It has some backwards breaking changes that not that not all of your code might immediately work well on. So I'd stay with I'd be happy with 7.3 for now. Um, if you're on anything below 7.2, I would try and get up because it is a lot faster. Um, the speed is yeah really it it, really it, it 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 really is like I think it's 40 percent difference from 5.6 to 7.2. Is it really makes a difference and. Um, as soon as we can get WordPress over to seven, you will, will make us happy too, because we're basically waiting on a lot of people that are stuck on 5.6 before WordPress itself will move to PHP 7. And PHP 7 would really make our development lives a lot easier. So, yeah. Next. All right. Let's stick with uh, speed for a bit. Um... Is Yoast heading in the direction of incorporating speed caching and three shaking optimization tools similar to plugins uh, such as Hummingbird? Uh, no. That's a quick one. So honestly, we try not to do that because there are, otherwise we become a kitchen sink plugin. We, we become the thing that does everything and, and it's really hard to do the things that you do really well. 
So focusing on SEO and social alone and doing the schema bits, et cetera, around that right and well is already a task for a hundred plus Yoast people. Um, adding speed to that would, would require us adding a whole lot and a whole team on that and doing a whole lot more. So no, we're not going to do that. And the people who are doing it do it phenomenally well and they integrate nicely with Yoast. So it doesn't make sense for us to be reinventing that. Really. No, but honestly, it's also so much of it is hosting related. So much of it. I mean, yeah. a, a good host can do so much. If you look at, for instance, SiteGround uh, and what they've done with their their own speed plugin and how they are working on that is phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, we have no intent of ever competing with that. We've got enough right. to do. Um, so talking about things to do, there was a question. And again, we get so many comments that I'm scrolling and searching. But um, that was about Divi. Yeah. Is there a Yoast Divi integration to be expected anytime soon? Um, I, I, well, watch this space. Um, I that's all I can say. I I I I think we might have news about that in the coming months at some point. All right. So that's a cliffhanger. So people should be back next webinar, basically on March thirtieth. Yeah, they, everybody needs to be back March thirtieth. That that it, it they truly need to be. I can't help it. It, it we we need you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, let me see. We also have a question, and yes, here it is. Um, how does changing a URL using, of course, the Yoast redirect affect SEO? John, I all yours. Oh, gee, thanks. Um, so if you didn't have Yoast SEO and you weren't setting up redirects, you would have a problem. Anytime you change or delete a URL, you essentially lose all of the value associated with that URL, all the links, all the links from other websites, all of the nice user experience metrics that Google is measuring, all now are attached to a URL that doesn't exist. That's bad. If you redirect it, mostly good. Um, so. General, the S, generally, the SEO industry thinks you might lose a little bit of value if you're redirecting a page, maybe 5%, maybe 3%, nobody knows. Um, and certainly, it's a bad thing to redirect into a redirect, but mostly, you're going to be okay. Um, that said, I would avoid, I would try to avoid being in a position where you need to change URLs. So you need to be planning your content structure and how things are retired and where things live in a way that minimizes how often and how much you need to do that. Because at some point you're going to make a mess of interchange, intertangled links and redirects into redirects. That ends up creating headaches and you will definitely impact performance with that. But for the most part, if you delete a page or move a page and set up a redirect, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't obsess about it. All right. So next we have sort of a procedural question because we usually have something called microsoft or bing news what what happened i i i'll show you i have slides on microsoft and where is it here microsoft we really news. like the teams at microsoft they're just there's a limit of interesting news that they publish i i mean this isn't news no. I'm, I, I can tell you that 15% of my searches are misspelled. You know why? Because <laughs> I typed them fast. I, I, yeah, this, this was the news. And I was like, if this is the news, then we're not going to cover the news. All right. That totally makes sense. <laughs> Although tactically, um, it's worth saying, don't try and optimize for misspellings. Like, but all search engines are mostly smart enough to understand that words uh, are mistyped and misspelled don't have 10 duplicative pages for 10 misspellings of a term that doesn't work once upon a time maybe but no yeah no 1990 called them once it's seo strategies back yeah uh. <laughs> <laughs> all right so not talking about 1990 but about the future we've covered this in previous webinars as well um amp should we use it i i have to John, I was going to answer this one because he's by far more, well, he knows more about this than anyone, really. Um, I should tell you that he is on the AMP advisory board and he therefore might not be completely 
Um, wow. Well, you're I'm saying he's slightly biased. Uh, he's slightly yeah. biased. <laughs> but I'm, I'm biased for, and I'm on the AMP advisory committee because I believe that AMP is a fundamentally good thing for the web and for most websites. So the question is, should all websites use it? No. Um, there are definitely some use cases that AMP is not suitable for. If your website has lots of custom JavaScript and interactivity and even some types of e-commerce at the moment aren't well suited. It's still an evolving standard. There's still bits that don't solve for those kinds of problems. However, for many websites and certainly for many WordPress websites, small businesses, blogs, lead generation sites, I think AMP is often a great solution and also very, very easy to implement on top of your existing theme via the official AMP plugin, which will work a whole bunch of magic and speed up your site. In fact, to the earlier question of how do I speed up my mobile site, um, installing the AMP plugin and clicking activate might be the best advice you can get. We should definitely cover AMP in more detail on, on our speed webinar as well. You should, yeah. All right, already noted. I see Nink right in the background. Um, so what's WordPress doing about importing WebP images? Um, Nothing, well, they are not supported. Oh, uh, they are not supported yet. I know the media team wants to support them as they do also want to support SVG, which we also don't support yet. Um, I, I hope we'll bring something new to this in 2021, uh, because well, we all agree that this is something that, uh, WordPress needs. So um, we'll see. Yep. In the meantime, right. Cloudflare will automatically convert many of your images to WebP in the background, um, so you don't have to. But yeah, it would be nicer to get native support. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Talking about support, I think this is related to the Yoast SEO plugin. Um, yeah. So there's, there are other plugins out there that, and that allow you to manually enter schema code. Um, I will tell you right now that we will not do that. Um, why will we not do that? Because the, the schema we output is a large graph that is completely interconnected. You can absolutely tie into that with code. So look at developer.yoast.com and look at the schema API that we have there. If you want to add schema, you have to understand how we build graphs and how we relate those things. And then you can add your own stuff. But manually adding schema code to a page really doesn't work with the way that we do schema because that creates all these separate snippets of schema that tie to a specific bit on the page and do not tie them to the overall schema graph that we are building for the entire page that explains what a page is about, what who that page is published by, where within your site that page lives, etc. So no, you will not allow you to manually en enter one. It's also, if I'm being honest, the a relic of the uh, the old way of thinking about SEO, where we could just do some some, some tiny hacks like that. We're trying to approach this far more the, from the other way around and not making it hard for users to do this. So we're trying to give you all the stuff that you need to get the schema on the page by giving you blocks that 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 do that. So if there's stuff that you can't do with the SSEO that you would like to do, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, but we're not going to let you manually type in your schema code. And then it's it's so hard to do that well like the, the the thing that nobody really talks about in the schema space is the most important thing isn't the bits that you define it's the relationships between them it's how these things are connected and that's the bit that we put so much energy into getting right if you're just pasting in bits of schema code you're going to break it and it's going to make a mess yeah it's right. it's only something we feel very passionately about especially john <laughs> and myself <Yeah. laughs> Yeah, but it is actually a good question because we've yeah, seen is. this before. So yeah, yeah, thank you for asking, yeah. uh, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, completely different, and this is probably going to end up in the it depends category. But what should be the strategy for a brand new news website? Because a lot of content is duplicate. Honestly, if that's the case, you're doing it wrong. Because it's if you, <laughs> it, it, yeah, if everybody else already has it, then it's not news. Um, it, what you, what news sites need more than anything else these days is 
proper news or an, an, another angle or deeper dive or a specialism or something that makes you different. You're not going to be the next BBC. You're not going to out BBC the BBC because you can't afford to. The BBC has like 3000 journalists. You know why? Because they don't have to run like a public company. So you can't win in that in that space. The Guardian is a huge corporation. You can't compete with that sort of stuff. So you have to come up with something that's truly you, something unique, some a new angle, a new approach. And then this question will not come up. So basically what you're saying is make sure your content is not duplicate. I've done SEO work for The Guardian. I can honestly tell you, competing with that team on news is only something you should do if you work for The Washington Post or the BBC or, well, the big, the big players, because you can't compete with that. So compete on something very niche that you know about, that you can actually be the best on. All right, that sounds like a solid strategy. Um, then I want to do a final call for questions because we only have a few minutes left. So if there's this pressing question that you want to ask Joost and Jono, make sure that it is in the comments on Facebook or on YouTube right now, um, because we can only do one or two more. And if not, come back by March 30th. Yeah. Absolutely. I did just see an excellent question in the chat from Gregory on YouTube saying, is there a tutorial on getting started on SEO stuff? Um, yes, there is. Yoast SEO Academy is um, a phenomenal resource that we build, maintain, evolve, grow. Um, go check it out on yoast.com, sign up, do the free lessons, and then see if you want to specialize further. Um, that is the place to start for sure. All right. So where do people find that again? Hmm. Yoast.com. Oh, there's there's our new jingle. That's good. <laughs> I am I'm, I'm so gonna jiff that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now I I think the the best place would be yoast.com and then academy in the menu. Um, and then you 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 start by hitting on the free button. And uh, and then if you really like us and, and would like to see my face and even more videos, pay for it, pay up and you'll get even more. And it won't be just Yoast. To assure you, if they don't like your face, if they don't like the my face, they, they get to look at other people like Taco and Jono and Marika and uh, well, our academy team and well, a lot of a lot of different people. Yes. All right. So I see a last minute question come in uh, that is by Michael. Will you be doing another webinar on Google Update on mobile? I think if there's news in that area, we'll always cover it in this webinar. Yeah, I I have a very hard time thinking about mobile as something different than desktop. Yeah, it is the same web. Yeah, uh, it looks different, but yeah. yeah. All right, and then I think we're really at the end because uh, we're getting to the personal stuff here which we always like to also include Cheryl saying hi Yoast. Good to see you. Aww. And it's well, it's it's good to see these people. Um, I, I think we should just call it a day, shouldn't we, Taco? Absolutely, yes. I'm going to remind everyone once again that March 30th is the next date for um, the webinar. And maybe we can throw in the new url that we just sort of soft launched yeah yoast.com slash webinar i think it's it's not perfect yet and we and it will get better but if you are wondering when the next webinar is then yoast.com slash webinar should really help you to answer that all right and with that i want to thank you very much for today's webinar and see you again in march